training seminars you went to. Would that be accurate? Yes. And they covered all different things from uh, scene processing, latent processing, uh, blood stain pattern documentation, uh, luminol use, uh, legal issues to consider for forensic professionals, and then it goes on to arson, fire scene, different things, correct? Yes. And so you've had, during your career, a wide range of training and classes you went to to help understand your job that you did. Yes. And part of the training, as the, Mr. Himes pointed out, was presented by a Randolph Beasley. Yes. And you see him in court today, right? I do. That's a defense expert. Yes. Now, you also are a member of a professional affiliation. Is that not correct? Now? Was then? Yes. And which one was that? International Association for Identification. And what is that organization? It's uh, comprised of fingerprint developers, fingerprint examiners, crime scene responders, shoe and tire examiners, many different disciplines. And did you go to any workshops as part of your uh, affiliation with that association? Yes. And did you ever instruct uh, any courses for that association? No. Do you have any certifications from them? Oh, yeah, see this. They offer certificates or certifications, correct? Yes. Do you have any? No, I could have been grandfathered in in the beginning without doing anything, but I elected not to. So you were eligible, you just didn't care if you had to pay for it? Well, at that point, it didn't mean very much because you just, by nature of how long you worked, you could be grandfathered in, and I didn't see the point. Understood. So, it's fair to say you're trained in how to process a crime scene. Yes. And that would involve taking photographs? Yes. Are you familiar with the term alternative light sources? Yes. Could you explain to the jury what, what that term means? They just <coughs> help visualize a fingerprint sometimes when you process it with fluorescent powders. You use different light sources to make it visible so that you can photograph it. So they're helpful when you're taking uh, photographs of different pieces of evidence? Yes. And not only with alternative light sources, but lighting itself, the direction of the light, could be important? Yes. Because it could help either like, it stop from an item being washed out in the photograph? Yes. And it could highlight ridges or things about the item that you want to photograph that can um, make the thing seem, or be seen easier on the photograph that you can see in the naked eye? Yes. Now, the UV lights, a little handheld one that was shown to you that was on the counter yesterday. Objection, this state's testimony has a UV light. Overall, you can explain whether it was a UV light or a black light or any other kind of light. I'm going to exhibit 47. And if we can go to computer 4. You saw this item yesterday, correct? Yes. And what kind of light would you classify that as? I said it looked like a handheld black light. And the black <laughs> light, is that used for uh, identifying semen and saliva? No, not necessarily. What would you use that type of light for? I'm not sure. So you wouldn't use it? I haven't used it.
Now he also talked about uh, latent prints and the lifting of a print, correct? Yes. Now what is, in your training and experience, what is the benefit or the purpose of processing a scene for latent prints? Well, it'd be with the hopes of getting the prints of whoever had done the crime. I'm sorry, say again. The hopes of getting the prints of whoever had committed the crime. Uh, a print would show somebody was either at a location or touched something. Would that be fair to say? No. So, you could tell from a latent print that somebody committed a crime. No, you'd have to go further than that. Okay, so what is the benefit of actually pulling a latent print? Cannot a print put a person at a location where you obtain a print? If you can match them up. I'm sorry, the answer to that is yes. Okay. So the purpose is really to see who was there. Yes. Or see who touched something. Yes, but it doesn't necessarily show everyone who touches something. Just because there's not a print there doesn't mean they, didn't, they weren't there. Obviously. But I mean, if you find a print, you're like... <clears throat> This person was probably here or touched this at some point. Yes. Okay. And it says a latent print. What's latent mean? Latent means invisible, but it's used pretty widely. It's sort of if it's not a known print that we know was inked on purpose, even if it's kind of smudgy and dirty, we still call those latent prints, but they're not really invisible. And so if it's really invisible, you need to use something to make it visible. Yes. And that's the black powder that was referenced? Yes. And when you have the black powder, how do you apply that black powder to a surface that you want to test for latent print? With a brush. And is it kind of a smaller little brush, kind of the size of a pin with thin hairs on it? <coughs> sort of. There's different kinds of powders, so there's different kinds of brushes. Do you use the same brush when you're doing it for the different surfaces? It would depend. If I had found prints, then a lot of times we'll just go ahead and change. We can change brushes. We don't necessarily have to use the same one all the time. But you, you sometimes use the same one. It would depend. Not if we're processing items of evidence. Like if we're processing things that we really suspect probably have potential DNA on them and such, then we change brushes. And what are some good surfaces to get a, a latent print from? Uh, Non-porous surfaces. So smooth surfaces. Yes. Glass. Yes. Metal. Some metal. like that. So maybe doorknobs are always a good place to find stuff? They're actually not very good, but they are smooth. But they seem like they ought to be great, but they're very disappointing, but sometimes they're all right. How about doors? Doors are iffy, because if it's flat paint, it doesn't work as well. How about windows? Windows can be good. How about cups and mugs? They can be good. Now, have you... If an item is movable, let's just say you find my water <coughs> thermos at a scene and you're like, I find that there's latent prints, or there might be latent prints on this. Is that something that's probably beneficial to take back to the lab and process it in the lab versus at the scene? If it's a crime scene and it's found there? Yeah. Mm, maybe. And we still can, even if we do some processing at the scene. You can do more processing at the lab than you can at the scene, correct? Just doing more doesn't necessarily make it better. It might depend on what kind of surface and what you're trying to do, whether you have the facilities at the location you are, if you have what you need for it. But if you need further development, then the lab works better, yes. So, have you ever... Uh, seen the process of using super glue on the fingerprint. Of course, yes. And super glue is used because it hardens the print, correct? That's what they believe is happening, yes. And so when you harden it and then you dust on, 
you can actually attempt multiple lists off the same print. Yes. Is it true sometimes you can get a better print on subsequent lists than the first one? Not necessarily. I found both ways. Sometimes you can get perfect prints that look like a person just rolled them right onto a knife blade, say. <laughs> and you don't really get any better than that. So if the super glue wouldn't necessarily even make a difference. It would just depend on what the surface was and what you're doing. And then also you've been trained in how to collect DNA samples that you as you showed the jury, correct? Yes. And what's the purpose or benefit from processing a scene for DNA trace evidence? To find um, a person who might have been in that scene. And when you do uh, examination for DNA evidence, do you do that before or after you fingerprint? If it's the neck of a bottle, I'm not going to get prints anyway off that kind of ridgy stuff on the neck of a bottle. So we just go ahead and swab that area first. Some areas, uh, the DNA unit has assured me that the super glue or the black powder, especially just the black powder, is not going to hurt the DNA. The DNA could still be there. Okay, that's a good explanation. But the question is, do you do the DNA before or after fingerprint? Objection, argumentative. Ooh. Do you mean always? As a general practice. I base it on what item I'm processing. Does the latent print uh, processing sometimes happen before the DNA process? Yes. Have you ever heard the term transfer DNA? Yes. It's kind of like where you transfer, there could be DNA on this cup, and if something touches that cup and then touches... Objection the is counsel testifying or asking a question? I'm asking a question. Mm -hmm. It assumes facts, not evidence. Mm -hmm. If I touch this cup and then something touches the cup and then touches the mouse, DNA can transfer from one thing to another. Objection lacks foundation. It's considered extremely rare and unlikely. So there's two types of transfers, right? Primary transfer, transferring from a person to something. That's touch DNA. Right. And then secondary is like two DNA transfer events, which you say are more rare. Yes. Very so there's, there's two different kinds. Yes, transfer is not, touch is common because if it's not that you, if it's not your DNA, like I swabbed in your cheek and such, or your blood, then most DNA that we find would be touch DNA, somebody touched something. But for somebody to touch something that somebody touched and then put it on something else, it's just considered very rare. But it can't happen? I don't know. I mean, I've never seen it happen, but I can't say that it couldn't happen. So if I take a brush and I test this box for DNA, or for a fingerprint, and then I take the same brush and I test this chair for latent prints, could I not be transferring DNA from this box to that chair through that brush? Objection calls for speculation. Again, I've never seen that happen, but it is why we change brushes, just to avoid that question. Now you also mentioned you're trained in shoe impression. That's kind of like latent print, correct? Yes. And you went to a couple seminars on that in 1999. You did a detection and recovery of footwear and tire impressions. Yes. And in July of 2006, you did advanced technique for photographing shoe prints. Yes. If you take a picture of a shoe print and use a scale next to it, like a ruler, you, know, you guys have your own scale. Can you take that information and compare it to other shoes later? Objection or relevance? Sustained. It'll go to part of my, this is foundational for my cross later. Objection sustained. Uh, relevance, Can I approach on that? No, no. I, I need this for my cross run. And I can explain exactly why. All right, that's so approach.
And you were taught, if you see some type of blood evidence, what to generally look for, correct? Yes. So if you see a bunch of blood somewhere, they, that could be something important to take a picture of. Yes. And they told you where to look as well, correct? Like if, if you have a blood scene of a bloody body on the floor with clear injury, look around for any kind of spatter that could come from that body. Well, my training classes told me where to look? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And your experience as well? Yes. And so you would look on the walls, you'd look on the ceiling, just to take a look and see if there's anything that spattered or cast off or any of that went anywhere. Yes. And you're also taught the bloody scene to where to look for blood that might reside if somebody tried to clean up. Would that be fair to say? Direction relevance. Overall. Yes. So maybe cracks in corners of walls or cracks in floors is always a good place to look. Yes, if we know there's been blood there, we don't. It's hard to know where to start if you don't know there ever has been blood there. And you know to look at carpets and rugs because if those fibers could hold on the blood better than, a, say, a tie. Yes. Now, just total ballpark. How many crime scenes would you say you process for violent crimes? I'm not holding you to the answer, so just. So I don't know, 300. How many of those would you say have been homicides? Rather than death investigations or suicides? How about just death investigations? That's probably a better word. Okay, death investigations, probably 280. 
Less than 300. And how many of those scenes involve blood evidence? Mm -hmm. Less than 250. Now, in your experience, in your, you did it for 20 years. Right? <laughs> would it be reasonable to not collect evidence from a scene just because it would take too much time? No. How long do you think is too long to work on a scene to collect evidence? Objection. Calls for speculation is made. It depends on the circumstances, obviously. How long is, would it be too long to process a scene of a family of four that's missing? Objection. Calls for speculation. Sustained. Have you ever spent more than eight hours at a crime scene? Objection relevance. Over rules, please. Many, many times. How many times in your career would you fall apart? At a regular homicide or a investigation scene. It could be hundreds of times. Yes. Now, are you familiar with uh, the use of luminol? Yes. You've actually, in your training, you've uh, had multiple classes on that, correct? Yes. How is luminol used? If you could explain it to the jury. We quit using it because it destroys DNA. It's bad for DNA. So we stopped using it. But you spray it. It has to be a dark room. You have to already suspect. We never sprayed it randomly. Like, it's not, it's used to see where the blood might be when you already know something must have happened there. It's not something we sprayed around ever to just find blood. But it's sprayed in the dark, if you have an idea of where you want, where you're trying to look. And we set up a camera because first with the light on, we take a photo. And then we'd be ready with the camera so that when we spray the luminol, it glows. It glows a blue color. And then it would glow and we take a picture and it looked good. When you turn the lights off and take a picture, do you use any alternate lighting? You could take a, you could click your flashlight just for a teeny bit of light to get a little more light in the room. Yes. You so does the, the the luminol light up on its own, or do you have to light it up with some type of light source that the camera can pick up? Yes, and you have to also use like a yellow, the yellow glasses. Mostly, I'd be operating the camera from listening to you spraying up. Back in those days. And then, have you heard of uh, fluorescent? I think if I'm pronouncing that right. Fluorescent? F L U O R E S C E I N? That's the name of the blood enhancement thing? I haven't heard of that. Do you not use that? No. Fluorescein. Thank you. I'm pronouncing it wrong. Never use that? Yes, use fluorescein. Okay, what's that? It works pretty much like the luminol. Um, you use it to determine the area of where the blood might have gone to. And it'd be used in a kind of case where somebody said, Joe killed Bob out in the garage and shot him 10 times in the head and cleaned it up. But then we go there and look, and we don't see anything. But we believe Joe. Maybe he's telling the truth. So then we would use something like fluorescein to see if we could find where the blood was. And it's used basically the same. Yeah. Is fluorescein used now instead of luminol? I think they're using Blue Star, but I'm not sure. I've been gone for five years. And you did a training on using Blue Star versus luminol? Yes. And have you ever used, uh, taken a photograph using any of these items? Yes, all of those. And how many times would you estimate at scenes that you've done that? Probably not that many, probably 20. And do you know if it's possible to test or photograph or look for blood that's been painted over? Uh, yes. I haven't had it work, but I've heard that it's possible. So you've seen the documentation of experts saying it can be done, you've just never seen it done successfully? Objection calls for speculation and lacks foundation. Well, the objection sustained is phrased. 
you've seen the information on the technique to be used? Not the technique, I've just heard that it had been done. You haven't used it yourself? No. Now I mentioned that the criminalists serve a different purpose than the field uh, techs do. Were there any criminalists at the scene of the McStay house on February 18th? Yes. How many were there there? Two. Nineteen. And what did they do? One was in training, and the other one was training her. They were creating a sketch of the house. So the scientists just did the sketch? I don't know if they did other things. I was taking those photographs. I'm going to move to the 20th first. I'm going to, start, I'm going to go back. I love going back. The Zuzu Trooper, you processed, you said, on February 20th of 2010. Yes. And you arrived at the process as at 9 a.m.? Yes. And you left at 1320? Yes. So you were there approximately four and a half hours? Yes. And you processed the trooper and you looked. Did you find any blood? No. Did you find any signs of violence inside the car? Objection. As soon as facts not in evidence. Did you find a broken window? No. Did you find uh, any bloody weapons? No. Did you find anything inside that vehicle that shows a crime was committed before you processed it? Objection calls for speculation. Did anything stand out for you when you first went through the processing of the, just looking inside the vehicle to say a crime happened here? Objection still calls for speculation. No. And even though you didn't see anything in there, you still processed it, right? Yes. You've dusted it for prints. Yes. You lifted three prints from the interior, not counting the ones off the coffee in the water bottle. I believe that I could check my notes just to make sure that's correct. Would you want to review that just to make sure you're correct? Yes, please. Sure. Thank you. Yes. And then you also uh, lifted fingerprints from the silver coffee cup? Yes. I'll show you exhibit 145. We can have oh where am I already? Just thinking. It's like me in the morning. Is that where the uh, coffee cup and water bottle were located? Yes. And that is in the center console between the driver's seat and the passenger seat? Yes. Did you decide to try and do fingerprints on those items because they're in close proximity to where a driver would be seated? They were just the most likely items. Well, partly that, yes, close to the driver and in the front seat, so close to any passenger. But also, they were a pretty good surface a lot of times for DNA or print. Because they were smooth in glass or metal? Yes. And then, I'll show you exhibit 159. These are the ones that we saw earlier, correct? Yes. These are after they were processed? Yes. Did you use the same brush on both items? No. You used a different brush? Yes. How many brushes do you normally carry with you? Probably just to carry about, I don't know, 15. They're disposable. So then after you, you dust your fingerprints first when you're processing before you did DNA, correct? Objection. Uh, mistakes or testimony assumes facts, not evidence. Oh, 
On the cup, I dusted first, but on the bottle, I swabbed that neck part first. How about the inside of the vehicle? Did you dust it? But did you dust the inside vehicle for fingerprints? No, I don't believe so. Well, you recovered three from the interior of the vehicle, didn't you? Yes, but I'd have to see what they were on to know. Does your notes tell you where they're on? No, the cards themselves would. Do you, do you have those? No, I don't have fingerprint cards. Did you make the cards? Yes, I made the cards. Would that be something that's kind of important to note in your report on where you located the, the print from? No, because if that, well, I mean, it wouldn't hurt, but if the print came to any fruition, then the person making the report would be the late print examiner, and they describe my card and what it says on it, if they say either it was of no use or it matched something. So that's where the report part comes in that actually identifies it. But you today, based on the report you wrote, you cannot tell me where you pulled those latent prints. No, and it wasn't in all that important to me because I didn't know what would become of them. I didn't know if they were nothing or if they were something. And it didn't really even matter to me if they were nothing or something. Right. So the purpose of a report is to give information in the future when something you've done all of a sudden becomes important, right? Objection argumentative. Well, that's why the late print examiner does that report and does tell. And that's why we have to draw a picture on our fingerprint card. We draw a little photo, like not photo, but a little picture showing where we got that print, what the orientation was, if it was on a counter, which way is pointing on the counter, if it's on a glass. It's really important because on a glass beer bottle, if the print's pointing up, you know, the hand, then the person's pointing like this. If it's like this, then they were holding, you know, that neck a whole different way. So we put an orientation, a picture, say where we got it, and then the latent print examiner has that information. Did you do latent prints on the steering wheel? No, I think it was kind of a, I don't think it was smooth. It was more like a leathery wrap type thing. Did you do it on any of the center controls? Uh, no. I don't think so. But I'm not sure. Then you went through uh, and used DNA swabs as you testified on direct, correct? Yes. You used uh, two swabs on the steering wheel? Yes. And not in separate locations, but the same location? Yes. And then you used two swabs to do the various things in the center console, correct? Like the center area between the driver and passenger's area? Yes. And that includes the gear shift, four-wheel drive lever, radio controls, and the heater and AC controls. Yes. And as you testified on direct, you do that because you want to put all the DNA together to hopefully get a stronger DNA sample. Yes. So when you do that, can you say the DNA for sure came from the gear shift or for sure came from the radio? Objection lacks foundation. Oh. No. One of the downsides, I guess, to using the same for multiple locations, right? Yes, it's a downside, but it's a payoff sometimes, too, as opposed to getting nothing. It's a, it's a balance. Yes. And you have to make that discretionary call. Yes. And you did the inside of the driver's door, the handle, power windows, and power lock controls, all with the DNA, same DNA swap. Yes, two swaps, I believe. And you did all those together, hoping you'd get DNA, because the more you, surfaces you do, the more chance you have to get DNA, correct? Well, that, and if the person used the, it, it kind of didn't matter either, whether, if they were operating the windows, then I pretty much assumed they had the doorknob, too. So, yes, it would just give a chance I'm getting more of it. And as you covered on direct, you also did the inside of the passenger door the same way? Yes. And the inside of the rear door? Yes. Now, when you processed the Zuzu Trooper, did you have any additional information that you did not possess the day before when you were at the Fallbrook House? I don't remember if I kn knew, I think we already knew when we were at the Fallbrook House that the car had been recovered in San Ysidro. That's 
kind of abated a different kind of scene, but yes. I mean, the no. testimony was that that was learned on the 15th. So, just so to make okay. your mind clear. So, it, it, it wasn't new information, but it was not comparable to the house as far as processing would go. So, the day prior, on February 19th of 2010, you arrived for briefing at 9.55, correct? At the house, you saying? I'm sorry. No, it's at briefing first. Yes. And you met with multiple detectives. Everybody can kind of meet and go over what you're there to do. Yes. You were told you're going to go into a house to process? Yes. And they tell you that they had a search warrant to search for DNA, fingerprints, and any other possible evidence. Jackson, that calls for hearsay. Multiple layers. I did not hear what was on the search warrant. Did they tell you this is a missing person? Yes. A missing family? Yes. There was four people missing? Yes. And they did not know, well, they did not see any obvious signs of violence the first week they went through a couple days before? Objection. Did they tell you that? I don't recall that. What did they tell you? They said it was a missing family and that there had been people in the house since they were last there and some things had been moved and changed, but I didn't know what was moved or changed. And that there had been some cleaning being done in the house since they'd been there. And that was disconcerting, very. But, again, I didn't, it was really hard to know what had gone on in that house or what had happened. We just wanted to find out. Were you instructed to process the scene where it could possibly develop into an emergency? We all were taught. Wait, I'm sorry. Did they tell you to process the residence as if it could be a murder case? Possibly. I knew to process it that way, yes. So, going in with that mindset, you knew it was important then to process the entire house? Yes. And you had to take photographs? Yes. You had to look for blood evidence? Yes. Probably good to take fingerprints of different places where you'd obviously find fingerprints. No, because, well, I won't say no. It certainly couldn't have hurt. It wouldn't have harmed anything. But at that point, we were very aware that this family might be coming back into their house. And I'm telling you, when you start throwing fingerprint powder around a house, all over a house, you basically ruined it. In this case, that turns out that wouldn't have mattered anything. It would have dwelled in with it because they couldn't come back. But when you're thinking that that family might come back in there, and they're going to have to go to their insurance company to pay for somebody to come in and clean up their house. This stuff is just like when you have a smoky oven fire or something, and it just soot goes all over, and that's almost how bad it is when you're putting fingerprint powder everywhere. So you really have to think about it before you do that. You didn't hesitate to do it to the vehicle, though, right? That was a vehicle. Ah. It wasn't their house. You could have just processed the points of entry, couldn't you? Well, some of the problem when we're comparing the vehicle to the house is the house, they may have not been there at all when any kind of crime happened. They may have been gone. But their vehicle being left there in San Ysidro seemed very, very strange to me. And I really felt like we had a good chance of finding out if somebody else had driven or moved that vehicle because that was a lot stranger than the house being empty, I thought. And you could have checked for DNA evidence also on points of entry or anything like that, correct? In the house? Yeah. I'm sure there would have been 100 people's DNA in the house, probably. But you could, if there's multiple mixtures of DNA, you could figure out who's part of those mixtures, right? Objection lacks foundation speculation. If they were in a system, like if they had had their DNA put into a system prior, if not, what you have is a whole bunch of people's DNA that you don't know who they are, what they are. Are they workers of the house? Are they family? Or what? And if you don't collect it, you just have nothing. That's true. And you can also go in 
since you know the family's not there, is part of your analysis that they may have been taken by force against their will? There was that possibility, and that that was something that was really hard to try to even determine. Would it be smart then when you're going in to think, if we see shoe impressions or shoe prints, we should take those? I didn't see any shoe prints. That wasn't the question. The question was, if you saw shoe impressions, would those be important things to take since you don't know if that family was forced out of the house? I would have taken photographs of them if there had been any. And the whole point of doing all this, right, you don't know what this case is about yet when you went in on the 19th. On no. You're at the beginning of the investigation. Yes. And that's standard for a crime scene processing. You're there, usually that's the first piece of evidence that everybody's gathered. Generally, would that be fair to say? This is really different than any, anything that I've ever been to before as far as trying to figure out what was going on. But this is your time to gather the evidence that may become relevant in the future, right? Yes. You only get one shot. Well, yes, but I didn't know that at that point either. There was always a potential that we would be going back in that house if we found out something that could lead us to something that would make us do a better job inside that house, too. And if you have the evidence, you can maybe identify perpetrators involved. Right? Maybe, maybe yes. That's what you do it for. During the processing of the house, did you make any suggestions as to what needs to be processed? No. Do you have the ability to make suggestions if you think something's important? Yes. Because you've been, at that time, you had been doing it 16 years? Uh, yes. And you process now 280 death scenes at least. At least. The lead detective had been doing it three years. He said that was his 20th case. You probably have more experience than he does, right? In what I do. Processing a scene. Right? Yes, but there's a lot more that goes into processing. I mean, the detectives are all part of the processing, but in a different manner. It's forensic processing, yes. I have more experience than he did. And so you made the choice to not fingerprint the front door? Yes. And you made the decision not to process the open window to the office that was used for entry by the brother, Michael McStay, days before? That window was no more important for being open otherwise. I mean, because even if a perpetrator had come to the house, just because Michael McStay went in through that window doesn't mean that somebody coming to the house went in through that window. They might have come in the front door. But if you print it, you'll know. If, if prints come back to some unknown suspect, that could be where they came in, right? Jackson calls for speculation. Sustained gun argument. Processing points of entry is important to see if some unknown person entered a home, right? I think it depends. Did you know at the time you're processing that the office window was a point of entry by somebody at some point? Yes. And you chose, you made the decision not to process it? Yes. And the sliding glass door, did you process that? No. And did you make that decision not to do it? When you're saying it this way, I didn't make a decision to do it or not to do it. I didn't do it. And I didn't do it for any of the doors and windows, if we're going to go over each of them. But I, it's not like I ever said, I'm not processing that door or I'm not going to process that window. You just, ah, uh, we don't have time? No, hardly did I take that attitude. Well, Detective Duvall did. Objection, argumentative, move to strike. Sustained. Instead of fingerprinting, did you at least do a DNA swap? We saw how quick that's done. Did you do that on the points of entry? No. Did you do it on the door, maybe on the back side, so when someone can leave and they close it? No, we rarely do that. And you already said you did not take any shoe print impressions or photographs inside? No, because I didn't see any shoe prints inside. Now, the briefing was at 9.55, but 
But you arrived at the residence to start processing at 1047. Is that accurate? I'm not sure. I don't think mine will explain to that detail. It did. That's where I got the numbers from. Oh, really? Yeah, if you want to review that, then uh, it's on the type. Okay, let me take a look. I believe it's the type. It might be your hand right And would reviewing your notes help refresh your memory of when you entered and left? All right. Yes, we arrived, I arrived at the briefing at just about 10 o'clock. And we ran into the, went into the residence, I'm sorry, at 10.47. And what time did you leave? At... Should be on the same page. At about 5 p.m. So you were there about 6 hours, 13 minutes? Yes. So I want to go through the processing you did, but again, like I said, I like to go back. So let's start upstairs. I'm going to show you Exhibit 727, which is picture 479. Do you remember this photograph? Yes. And this is at the top of the stairs in that landing area you described. Yes. And you're looking towards, to the left would be the master bedroom. Yes. And you see a placard A in the middle of that doorway straight in the middle of the picture. Yes. And then uh, exhibit 728 is a mid-range photo of that placard. Yes. And I'll show you 729, which is a close-up of that book at placard A, correct? Yes. And does there appear to be a red substance on that book? Yes. Who noticed that? I think... One of the detectives that was searching. It wasn't you? No, it wasn't me. Does that look like blood to you? It looks like it could be, yes. And the notes that you wrote, your handwritten notes, showed you did a KM test. Yes. What's a KM test? Castlemeyer. Could you explain to the jury what a Castlemeyer test is? Castlemeyer test has two parts, and... You first, you take a swab, same kind of swab we looked at before. You put sterile water on it. And in this, if it had been white blood, you wouldn't need the sterile water. You just rub it with the swab. But because it's dry, that helps rehydrate it. So we rub it on a little part of that. Don't even need very much, just a little part of it. And then you take the castle miter. It has an eyedropper, and it's just a liquid. And just leave the drop out onto that swab. And if it changes color, sort of pinkish, then you know that it's testing positive for blood. You don't know if it's human blood or animal blood or anything, but you do know that it's presumptive positive for blood. And then if you see a presumptive positive, you can go on to something else. Like you would do a secondary test to see what, if it is blood, if it's human, you could do stuff later. Maybe the DNA person does later. Yeah. I would just collect, well, I would collect the whole book, but... Right, but I mean, something can be done later to do more confirmation. Yes. But you did a, a KM or Castlemeyer test and it came back negative, correct? Yes, came back negative. Were you surprised by that negative result? Mm. No. Why not? Looks like what? Objection relevance. Sustained also looks uh, why did it surprise you? You said it could be blood. Objection. Same objection. Well, I've been doing this a long time, and I don't get surprised very easily. Is this the first time you ever came across a negative result? No. How many times do you think you've received negative Castlemeyer results when you're at a scene? Not a lot, but it happens sometimes. Is it true you are ethically bound? You cannot say something is blood without testing it and getting a positive result. That's true. Because looks can be, be deceiving, right? Objection, yeah. argumentative. Overall, it's Yes. 
Now let's move on to the upstairs bedroom. We will look at exhibit 96. This bedroom. You remember this room? Yes. Now, during direct, you were asked the thing in the lower left corner, that was an indoor sandbox? I didn't say indoor sandbox. I think I just said covered sandbox. That's right. Covered sandbox. And then the things in the center look like a bunch of mirrors, correct? Mirrors and picture frames, I think. Well, you have the large mirror in the back, and I will point to the uh, thing that every... Oh, no, I'll just point. The mirror in the back here, the larger one, that's up against the closet doors, correct? Yes. And then these are smaller picture framed mirrors, because you can see the reflection of the bag, reflection of the wall, correct? I think the ones on the right might be, yes, picture frames, but I don't really see a mirror in that one on the right. You can see the reflection of the cardboard on the underneath there? Objection, Miss. Uh, and on this one here? A misstatement of the evidence. Well, that would be a shadow. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, the objections are the rules. You can explain what's in the photograph. I'm really not sure. I mean, it looks to me, because I was using a flash, I don't know. If the window has those bars, that would convince me. Because the window has those dividers. I just can't tell by looking at it. But the, and that's, you're referring to the, to the picture frames or the frames that are black with gold edging. Yes, that I think is just a picture frame. You're not sure? I'm not sure, but maybe that window doesn't have those bars across it, so. The other ones, the gray with the gold little design, those are mirrors. Yes. And these are in the upstairs bedroom. Yes. Right next to that is the bathroom in the upstairs, correct? Mm. Now I'm talking about this bathroom. Yes, between those two bedrooms. Yes. And this is an overview shot of that bathroom. Yes. And if you look, and I'll do it here because this is the best way to show. Is there any mirror on top of the sink in the bathroom? No. And is that blue tape that's on top of the backsplash on the sink? Yes. And that seems to be a bunch of type of newspaper that's just on the counter, correct? Yes. And I will go to exhibit 101. This is another angle of that same sink, correct? Yes. More blue tape along the top of the backsplash? Yes. Blue tape over the uh, outlet and on the side mirror? Yes. We usually call that the medicine cabinet when I was growing up. Yes. See, Mike, somebody was painting in there and removed the mirror that was in the other bedroom? Objection calls for speculation. With what you saw at the scene, would that mirror in the other room be consistent to be the one that's missing from that bathroom? Objection calls for speculation. Have you ever seen a house that has two portrait mirrors ahead on top of the sink instead of a long mirror? Objection relevance. Sustained. It goes to the house renovations that they were doing, Your Honor, the evidence that's in the other room. Objection sustained. This bathroom, from your view, appears as being part of the renovation. Yes. That would explain why there's no towels in there, right? Objection calls for speculation. Let me show you 735. Again, the sink and the newspaper. Did you find any blood on any of this? I didn't see any. And on top of the newspapers, that looked like a unopened new towel rack. Objection calls for speculation. I think I did see a towel rack sitting there. And it looks like a matching uh, toilet paper holder as well, right above it. Right here. Yes, or at least some kind of gloves and attachment. Or a small towel, something. Yes. 
And you didn't see any blood anywhere on any of the paper there? It's actually no. asked and answered. I'll show you exhibit 736. This is the shower in that room, correct? Yes. And do you see any, did you see any blood in the tub? No. You zoom in, does it look like it's still dirty or has things inside of it? Protection calls for speculation. Oh. I don't remember how dirty it looked when I saw it. It looks in this photo like it is, so, or there's something in there. I don't know. It's not cleaned like no more blood evidence in here because I cleaned it. Right? Objection calls for speculation. Argument it is. I'll show you exhibit 616. This is the counter of the sink? Yes. That looked like it could be dust or dirt on the floor there. <coughs> There's some kind of discoloration. It could be that or buzz or something. And we'll go to the next exhibit, 617. When you open the sink doors, right? We uh, took a picture of what's inside? Yes. Does that give a better view? Seem like there's that dirt or something on the floor? Yes, it looks like it. And there's no blood anywhere inside that area either, right? Not that I saw. But I am taking my photos. When I'm moving along taking my photos, I'm trying to move along and take my photos. I'm, I mean, that's the best view I've seen of that. Because when I'm taking that photo, I'm just opening the doors, taking a photo moving over to the side, taking another photo, and et cetera, to get done so that the detectives can start searching. I understand. You're documenting the scene before anybody walks in. Yes. Yes, I, I get that. Any other I'm going to do one more room, then we can call, call lunch. I, have, I think I can finish one more room. Okay. I'm going to move to the laundry room that was on the second floor. Do you remember that room? Yes. I'm going to exhibit 730. That's the showing the relation of the laundry room to the stairwell on the right and the room on the left with the mirrors leaning and the picture frames leaning against the closet, correct? Yes. Then I'll go to exhibit 610. This is the floor at the entry to the laundry room? Yes. And you can say as you saw that cloth like dog. Uh, house or carrier or something inside that room, correct? Yes. Small little chew toy? Yes. And some items on the floor, I don't know what that is, and then uh, some black cloth item, correct? Yes. And then we'll go to 608. This is inside that room, correct? Yes. And you can see the dog cloth, the tan thing on the left? Yes. You can see a bunch of dirt on the ground, probably looks like kind of paw prints. Objection assumes facts not known as that it's dirt or paw prints. <laughs> Alright, what's that right there? It's dirt. <laughs> and the thing right here, is that probably a little dog bed for a puppy? Objection calls for speculation. Yeah. Well, Your Honor, the people ask the same type of question. The next room we'll get to after lunch. Objection. So. Argumentative. Move to strike counsels. Sustained. Objection. Sustained. Does that look like a dog bed? It looks like it could be, yes. And, and there's dirt all over the floor? Yes. Including in front of the washer and dryer? Yes. And there's stains on the, on the ground to the left of the dryer? Yes. Exhibit 93. This is a picture of the uh, washer in the sink in that same room? Yes. And here's another one of those uh, cushions that you described. It had the uh, styrofoam in the middle and then that billowing on the outside? Yes. Same, similar type of thing? Well, 
I don't know about styrofoam, though. No. More like some kind of padding. Yeah, I think, I think it's the word you use. Padding and then that billowing around it. Yes. The similar type item. Yes. And we identified that there's something underneath that on the left hand side of the prior witness, correct? Objection calls for speculation of some facts not in evidence with this witness. <laughs> Show you 587. That is not the picture I meant to pull. Get rid of that. 586. That's another picture, that same item. Our same location. In the lobby room, yes. Time to take lunch. Sure. We'll go ahead and take our uh, new recess this time, 15 minutes. Thank you, Molly. We are going to be in the screen. I can do it. Uh, we'll take our new recess until 1 30. We can the admonition set the floor more express in the things about the case and not be discussed the case. And we'll see everyone back at 1 30. No more than 15 minutes.